Hello and welcome to Saturday Soul. My name is uh, Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. and I'm the president and founder of the Liberation Movement. And we're so excited that you're spending your valuable time with us today. The Liberation Movement is focused on empowering the Black community through the power of Jesus Christ. And we have an awesome program planned for you today. Mr. Ronnie Vanderhorst, uh, who spoke with us last month, starting kicking off our series on the topic of covering, uh, is doing his second part on today. So if you could, if you're watching, please put your, your name and where you're from in the chat. We'd love to know who's watching. Um, and please share with those, uh, your friends and loved ones, uh, this is going to be a very powerful program today. So with that, uh, one of the things that we have really focused on is really getting some grounding. This is our second year in existence, and we really wanted to make sure that we under, understood from which we will do our programs. And a part of that was developing a, a model, and it's the model of Black transformation. So with that, uh, I would like to play a little video to tell you more about it. The work of the liberation movement is grounded in the Black transformation model. We believe that there is a five-step process that will lead to the advancement of our people. These steps inform all work that we engage in. The first step is decolonization, which we define as the holistic process of letting go of colonial practices, values, and culture, adopting and returning to indigenous ways of knowing and being. In other words, a change of mindset centering African ways of thinking and living. The second step is abolition. We define abolition as being willing to fight injustice and dismantle practices, systems, institutions, and power structures. The third step is revolution. I define revolution as a fundamental change from the status quo that facilitates new ways of knowing, being, and operating. The fourth step is liberation. To be liberated is to be free from forms of spiritual, psychological, and physical oppression and captivity. The last step is sovereignty. When we say sovereignty, we are stating that we will be committed to supporting and or establishing black owned and operated institutions. So we take seriously Romans chapter 12 verse two, where it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Black transformation is our assignment, and we are committed to help liberate our people spiritually, socially, and psychologically through educational initiatives. Wow, we're, we are really committed to the decolonization and the liberation of our people. And so that's why it was so important to bring on uh, Minister uh, Vanderhorst uh, with us today uh, to kind of share ways in which Black men in particular uh, can strengthen themselves, in particular around the ways in which they cover the community. But I wanted to say hello to Jessica Simmons from, from Detroit, Michigan, and Walter Hardy from, from Maryland. Thank you so much for being with us being with us today. So with that, uh, uh, we want to bring on Minister Vanderhorst. Mr. Vanderhorst, how you doing? 
Hey, I'm still the undisputed happiest man in the world. Wow, wow. Well, we're so excited to have you uh, today. You really shook up, shook up some things last month when you introduced this concept of covering, and we're really looking forward to what you share uh, share today. Uh, we had a good time, not only on this platform, but we also jumped on uh, Clubhouse a little later after uh, after our initial program, and people were really engaging and learning more and pushing around that top, a topic of covering. So um, we're praying for you as you uh, share with us uh, the insights that God has uh, laid on your heart. So with that, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to just express my appreciation to you doctors, Sydney and Linda Freeman, for this important public venue of the liberation movement and particularly Saturday Soul that comes on once a month that gives the viewers the opportunity to process pertinent issues and concerns as it pertains to African black people. Today is part two of my three part series on covering naked and betrayed. And I want to particularly hone in on black man woman relationships, even though covering does extend um, and ripple out. Um, this is, I believe, central to us as we move into community, as we seek to provide those coverings that are quintessential, particularly as black males. In part one, I uh, gave a scenario from the Genesis narrative. And, you know, I really wanted to be fair about this because, as I said um, last month, that everyone doesn't share the same belief system. So when I use the Genesis narrative, I said that if you are an individual who is an atheist, an agnostic, if you're a pragmatist, um, whatever your belief system might be, uh, a believer, um, however you process what I'm seeking to share with you, I just want you to get the principle that I'm seeking to put across to you. So if you approach it from mythology or from uh, a particular uh belief system, however you approach it, metaphorically, that's okay with me. However, again, the principle is important. So I laid a little foundation about Ha Adam in the African Edenic Garden in the Genesis narrative. Ha Adam was the name of the man and the woman. And uh, the uh, creator created male and female, no, excuse me, man and woman. Let me correct that, man and woman. And so therefore in this African Edenic garden is where they were placed. And that African Edenic garden, as you heard this term was on the continent of Africa. On this particular continent, it's very interesting because it was so accessible the large continent, basically an individual with the stamina and time and ability could walk through the continent of Africa. It wasn't until 1884 in the Berlin conference where Europe sliced up Africa. There were really not the divisions that we see today. The, uh, the British took much of Southern Africa, the Germans took Namibia, the, um, no, the, yes, the Germans took Namibia, the Italians took Ethiopia and so forth and so on. But, um, and I'm giving a bit of history here. The Suez Canal, which was a man-made canal, didn't come about until around the 1850s. So when we look at the area of Palestine and uh, that particular section, 
it was actually Northeast Africa. The Suez Canal is 193 miles long. Can you imagine that Suez Canal not even being there? So therefore then that whole landmass was connected at the top of the Suez Canal, which it now is, it's still connected to the continent of Africa. Therefore, that whole area was Northeast Africa, but individuals could come walk in from the continent uh, 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 areas of Africa, let's say Kemet or Egypt, they could walk through to so-called Palestine before that Suez Canal came in to break up the land. Well, in this African Edenic garden, uh, the creator had Ha'adam, the creator made man and woman. In this particular scenario, we read about a tree called the knowledge of good and evil, which Ha'adam, man and woman, were not to eat of that particular tree. We read in that narrative that they did eat of the tree. And at that point, then, they hid. The narrative tells us that they sold fig leaves together and they were naked. However, this nakedness was not about physical nakedness because the narrative does not speak about them having clothes, that, but this nakedness was an uncovering, get that, an uncovering of them. And they sold fig leaves together. However, when the creator came into the African Edenic garden to see what had happened and asked Ha'adam man, you know, what went on, he said, we were hiding because we were naked. And the creator said in the narrative, who said you were naked? Did you eat of that forbidden tree? And right then, Ha'adam man further uncovered his wife, the woman, by in essentially blaming the creator saying the woman you gave me, she gave me to eat and I ate. And I am saying this is my jump off point, the tipping point of the uncovering of black women. It is also what I term and we'll see in the final session next month of the betrayal of black women. Uh, that's why the name of this series is Covering, colon, Naked and Betrayed. So since the man did not cover the woman, left her uncovered, now we have seen as we fast forward a portal of entry where now the collective black male in my point of view is not covering the black woman. Contrary to some of your thoughts, I am not broad brushing all black males. What I did was carefully word my one word question survey that I sent out to about 30 black women. And this was the question. Do you think the black male collective cover black women, married or single? If yes, how? If no, what? And last month I read a few of the responses of the sisters. I'm gonna only read a couple because I have a lot of ground to cover in a very short time, but this is one of the responses to that question. Does the black male collective, see, not individual, but collective, are they covering black women? This response said, no. Overall, it depends on the level of the security of the man. So inextricably linked to social, economic, and other social challenges. 
This is further exacerbated by the seeming hyper success of black women. The system itself encourages a divisive crab in the barrel response. Interestingly, the changing demographic and increasing prevalence of mixed ethnicities allow brothers colorful, conscious, soothing alternatives to dealing with sisters. Hmm, that's interesting. And the last one I'll read is, unfortunately, I don't find it to be a collective norm for black men to cover black women. As a black woman, it feels like our men still view our perspectives and experiences as dramatic and the dismissal or minimizing of our concerns persist. Whether we're discussing beauty, intellect, parenting, romance, homemaking, finances, etc. It feels like black men sometimes see us as competition, inferior, disposable, or a liability. Interesting. I have to say this. And for all of you who saw this this past week, Senator Cory Booker presented a master class before the country and the world on the covering of a black woman when he covered Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And we don't have to necessarily cover married black women. However, this brother unashamedly, powerfully covered this sister. And you could see the shift in the atmosphere, the shift in her spirit when he came out after these white males on the repub side had come for her. That's the covering I'm talking about. That's the experience that I'm simply alluding to. That's the necessity of covering black girls and black women at all times and in all places. And I doubt whether uh, Senator Tim Scott would have provided covering for Dr. Katanji Brown Jackson like Senator Cory Booker did. And I'll share some reasons why he probably would not have. So this is how I defined covering in our first session. Covering is a principle, process, and position that a black man should prioritize to protect the spirit, soul, and body of black girls and black women. I'll say it again. Covering is a principle, process, and position that a black man should prioritize to protect the spirit, soul, and body of black girls and black women. But I have a premise, and that is never discuss the fruit without understanding the root. I'm in the process of writing my ninth book, and it is entitled Black Men Interrupted. And so today I want to expose some root causes that interrupt, impede, inhibit black males from, as a collective from covering black girls and black women. And many of these are deep seated and they operate in default mode with many brothers. 
So I just want to put a tag on this second part of covering by calling it the souls of black males. The souls of black males. In my spirit model, I talk about spirit, soul, and body. I want to put up a definition of the first interruption, and that is trauma. If you, Dr. Joy DeGru, who writes the book Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome, helps us in our definition of trauma because it is my belief historically, currently, and in lived experience that the number one interruption of black males in this country and the diaspora is trauma. And it is the primary weapon of white supremacy on black males. Now I'm not excluding sisters, but I'm just simply focusing on black males here. This is what Dr. Joy DeGruy says. What is trauma? Trauma is an injury caused by an outside, usually violent force, event, or experience. We can experience this injury physically, emotionally, psychologically, and or spiritually. Traumas can upset our equilibrium and sense of well-being. If one traumatic experience can result in distorted attitudes, dysfunctional behaviors, and unwanted consequences, this pattern is magnified exponentially when a person repeatedly experiences severe trauma. And it is much worse when the traumas are caused by human beings. Much of this trauma from whiteness is rooted in the sick Freudian concept of penis envy. That's right, penis envy. Why do you think castration was so prominent? Our black woman ancestor and psychiatrist, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing taught that white males are obsessed with, get this, the fear of genetic annihilation. You see, whenever a black and white come together sexually, the birth is always a child of color. And this fear of genetic annihilation drove the black male craze from white males to castrate, a what I call a castration craze with lynching of black males as an equal obsession. Taking out either one of those heads was a necessity for whiteness. But however, since they have been outlawed, we will shortly see how whiteness went for the head again. But it was not the head of the penis or the physical head. It is the mind of black males. We'll get there shortly. I don't have time to elucidate on the kidnapping the great ma'afa, that is the great disaster that resulted during the Middle Passage, or the hundreds of years of enslavement, or as one brother called the plantation industrial complex, or all of the other subsequent racist legal inactions. It's extremely difficult, much less to intellectually negotiate this unabated trauma of our ancestors. But it's not over yet, not by a long shot. And that's why Dr. Joy DeGruy's book, 
post-traumatic slave syndrome identifies transgenerational adapta adaptations of slavery that still impact the black male collective to this very day and black people in general. Some folk think all that is past and others say that we are now living in a post-racial society. But the truth is this, trauma unaddressed is trauma undiminished. Next slide, please. So in my spirit model, we see spirit, soul, and body. We see spirit consciousness, self-consciousness, and world consciousness. So our physical body, with our physical body, the corporal part of us, we touch the world. In the soul, which is the home of our mind, emotions, and will, our will, you know, is our decision-making faculty. That is the home of our self-consciousness. And then we have our human spirit, which is spirit consciousness. Well, as I said in part one, all of nature functions from center to circumference from the inside out. And so therefore, it is our spirit, our human spirit. And when our human spirit is interrupted, when there is trauma that we experience, because nature functions from the inside out, what impacts our human spirit will then affect our soul. It will affect our mind, emotions, and our will. And the body simply will become the servant and carry it out. So in the plantation industrial complex of enslavement, when we read about and think about the trauma that was 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 meted out upon black males and black women too all of the egregious assaults and punitive actions the impact on our human spirit on our African black ancestors, human spirit could not help to affect their mind, uh, their thinking, how they thought, their emotions, how they felt and their will, what they did. There were those who were resistors, but the majority of them stayed on that plantation. And so in this construct, the trauma that they received to an extent and degree and gradations was passed on to their progeny, to us. You could even hear some terms, you know, uh, I remember brothers it, when, when they went to interview for a job and uh, the employer came in real low as far as wages and, and brother said, I ain't working for those slave wages. You see the association of slavery and wages. I'm not working for that, slave wages. And other things, you see, there is something that I'll, I'll bring up in a moment that is inevitable in some respects. And that's the whole aspect of predisposition. I'll get back to that. But things can pass on transgenerationally. That's why you have to read Dr. Joy Degree's book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, to really understand 
what actually happened then and the effects, the residuals, the collateral damage that still is impending and impactful in the souls of black males. So therefore, as we see this model, when a black man's spirit is interrupted, we cannot function in a state of normalcy. And that interrupted spirit inevitably affects, impacts our soul, our mind, emotions, and will. And again, as I say, the body becomes the servant and carries it out. Trauma affects a black man's spirit health, our spirit health, our mental, emotional health, and our physical health. You see, our human spirit is the activating or essential principle of our whole being. However, our spirit cannot communicate and it needs a medium, a mode of expression. So the expression of our spirit comes through our soul. What impacts our spirit comes through our mind. It comes through our emotions. It comes through our will. I hope you are understanding this process that I'm trying to posit to you. And that's why I'm honing in on the souls of black males, because it is here where we see how the traumas are played out on the battlefield of the black mind. Get this, uh, the root of all maladjustment is in the thinking. The African Hebrew King Solomon says, as a man thinks, so is he. Banned to Steve Biko, the Azanian journalist and activist. You see, it wasn't called South Africa. It was called Azania. Uh-huh. But banned to Steve Biko, who was an Azanian journalist and activist who was killed in police custody during apartheid said this, and I quote, the greatest tool in the hand of, of the oppressor is the African mind. I'll say it again. The greatest tool in the hand of the oppressor is the African mind. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, in his uh, uh, incredible book, The Miseducation of the Negro, another must read if you haven't read it, said this, and I'm quoting, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to tell him to go here or stand yonder. You don't have to tell him to go to the back door. He will go there automatically. And if there is no back door, he will cut one because his thinking has made it so. So understand, the brain is the organ, the mind is the function, and through the mind comes our thoughts. Let me give you just a little quick formula. You can write it down, capital, these are capital letters, T plus F equals CBP. T as in Tom plus F as in Frank equals CBP, Charlie, Bob, Paul. That's a simple formula that says thoughts plus feelings equal character, behavior, or problem. We cannot think right and feel wrong. Negative feelings come from negative thought processes. Let me give an analogy. My brothers, say for instance, you accept the thought process that all white males are superior. What will your feelings be? Put it in the chat. If you accept the thought process that all white males are superior, what will your feelings be? 
or sisters. If you accept the thought process that all males are superior, what will your feelings be? Inevitably, whatever you put in there, it would distill down to inferior. So that thought that all males are superior or that thought that all white males are superior gives us the feeling of inferiority. And to that extent, it becomes our character, what we are, our behavior, or our problem. We cannot think right and feel wrong. Negative thoughts come from, neg negative feelings come from negative thought processes. We cannot think right and speak wrong. Negative words come from negative thinking. You see, the focus many times is on behavior. You see, you have this whole law and order mentality. Lock the brother up, throw away the key. Because behavior becomes central. But the root of all maladjustment is in the thinking. As a man thinks, so is he. So our thoughts give us our feelings, and to that extent, it becomes our character, our behavior, or our problem. What we must do, and I'm just, just breezing by this, is we have to take that faulty feeling of inferiority, trace it back to the original thought, all white males are superior or all males are superior. And we have to replace that faulty thinking with the truth or the true thought process. And then we will get feelings of equality. And to that extent, it will become our character and eliminate that behavior or that problem. Last slide, please. So basically, when we look at that spirit interruption, I break it down into four categories. Weighted, wounded, oppressed, and violated. And again, when our spirit is interrupted, we cannot function in a state of normalcy. So with that trauma, then our spirit becomes weighted. We see the collateral damage of social and behavioral uh, and relational burdens and pressures that we experience in our man-woman relationships. We, the wounding, there may be words and denigrating names and mischaracterizations and labels, the oppressed spirit comes from all forms of oppression and uh, punishments and the punitiveness and then that violated spirit from physical and mental abuses and violence and so forth. All of this impacts a black man's spirit and seriously interferes in our covering of black girls and black women. There's, it's inevitable. Oh, there's one more slide I think I have. Please put that up there. There it is right there. Some of you got it already. But do you know what this is? This is one of the most recent definitions of trauma for black males. This was the length of time that the rogue policeman Derek Chauvin held his knee on the neck of George Floyd. It was a knee lynching. Yeah. You see, they always go for the head. 
of black males. And we continue to be re-traumatized. Every day, all day. And we never know when it's our turn, brothers. There's much more I could say as it pertains to trauma, but just read Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. But I will conclude by saying this. Trauma is the greatest interruption on the souls of black males. The second thing very quickly is whiteness. Whiteness interrupts the black male collective from covering black girls and black women as we should, as a collective. Alicia Garza is one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. And she said this in her book, which I have and read. I quote, if there, there were no black people, there would be no white people. Whiteness depends on blackness to survive. Whiteness as a valued identity would not exist if there wasn't blackness, an identity that has been associated with violence, crime, and dysfunction, unquote. Whiteness is the insatiable libido of white supremacy especially in the nine areas of people activity as Elder Nilly Fuller Jr. taught us. He said there is economics, education, entertainment, law, media, politics, religion, sex, which is family, and war. And these nine institutions in this country have always been and continue to be functionaries of white supremacy. Male whiteness is its pimp. So we see white male hierarchical, patriarchal privilege and policies and politics and protocol and practices. And it is so pervasive, it's indoctrinated everywhere in the school systems. In fact, Langston Hughes said back in 1945 that racism was over, seriously over, but in many respects, it became covert. And this was his conclusion. He said that all a person has to do is, I'm quoting, all a person has to do is subscribe to the norms of that institution and the institution will do the discriminating for them. I said, whoa, just to be in the institutions. Our ancestor, Dr. John Henry Clark, incredible historian said, and I quote, Europeans not only colonized lands and peoples, they also colonized information. And so black males in these institutions and systems get by default whiteness in the minds. It's there. It's a subliminal subduction too. And then the brothers who acculturate and assimilate into that dominating culture begin to deal with women like white males deal with women. De facto protégés of white males, as I call them. So the inequities and the objectifications and the sexism and the patriarchy and the misogyny and all that comes into play. And if a brother is not careful by default, 
His mind has been impacted by whiteness. There's the prison industrial complex. We see what happens to black males. The intentional onslaught have brothers like Brian Stevenson whose work is to get black males off of death row as they are able to investigate and research and adjudicate and get DNA. And we just see the numbers of them falsely accused. They're brothers who are locked up because of certain choices they made. But I'm going to come back to that in a minute. We have predisposition that impacts black males. There's a scripture that says the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That's from the prophet Isaiah. There's another text that says, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. This is an area that is not really explored when we are looking at the issues and situations of black males that, that, that impacts the thinkings and the behaviors of black males, predisposition. where we may have similar character and hereditary traits passed down to us through our hereditary line. Then there is, next to the last, is the eye effect. I'm just about done. The eye effect. That is my conceptual framework that I broached in our first session indoctrination, internalization, and institutionalization. Because brothers in this so-called host environment of the disunited states, we are constantly and continually indoctrinated, not educated, because as I said last month, true education will educate us how to think. Indoctrination trains us what to think. And so the indoctrination, which always has an agenda, which is a portal of entry into somebody's belief or beliefs or belief system. With that indoctrination, if it is not countered, if it is not resisted, that indoctrination becomes internalized. And then the black male collective can begin to function on that internalized indoctrination. What do you think is happening in some of the music and some of the bars? where black women are called itches and hoes and the denigrating names and euphemisms. That is from an indoctrination that has been internalized. And then when it gets institutionalized, that means a brother is locked in. He will sell a sister. He will betray a sister for money, for the Benjamins. Because now he's institutionalized in a mindset that does not cover black women, but pimp them, objectify them. The eye effect. Dr. Bobby Wright, and I'm ending here. Dr. Bobby Wright, who is 
now an ancestor. I have his book. Um, he was a psychologist. He's now an ancestor. One of his books is entitled The Psychopathic Racial Personality. An eminent black psychologist that introduced us to the concept of menticide. I'm quoting, by memory, menticide is the deliberate and systematic destruction of a group's mind with the ultimate purpose being the extirpation of that group. X means out of, stirps is like the trunk of a tree. The extirpation of the group to do what? To pull up by the roots. Well, who are I, our African identity, our African culture? Meant aside, the collective black males are have had meant aside, and meant aside is one of the most successful of whiteness's ploy on the black mind. But there's a pivotal place that I'm certain many of you are thinking. And that is that whole issue of free will. You know, where, where many think and, and, and have said that black men can make their own individual choices on how they treat and relate to black girls and black women. There are others who say that yeah, Vanderhorst is pimping this old tired victim mentality and blame game on whites and whiteness, white supremacy. And it's just an excuse for brothers not taking personal responsibility for their own choices and decisions pertaining to a lot of things, even black male woman relationships. Well, Dr. Wright said, yes, quoting, there is no question that the analysis of the victim methodology involves seeing the victim as the cause of his own problems and have been a major scientific development of white scientists because it effectively leads away from the cause of the black conditions, which is white pathology. Uh huh. So Dr. Wright concludes, and I'm concluding where he says, yes, we do have free will. We do, we are free moral agents, but what is not taken into Discussion are the conditions that are created that black males must operate our free will within. Mm -hmm. See, we'll talk about the, the choices, but we won't deal with the conditions that we must operate our free will within. And it is only by the decolonizing and deconstructing of the indoctrination, the internalization, and the institutionalization that we have received that we can ever be able to properly and appropriately and consistently cover our black girls and black women. I know I went past my time, I'm done, but we can definitely pick this up on Clubhouse. Yes, well, thank you so much. This was so rich and and so powerful. Uh, just one question. Um, so, so with all the trauma that Black men have gone through, um, what is the solution? What is the way in which Black men can um, be healed, be healed so they can be the men that they need to be for our community? Well, I will definitely deal with that in part three next month. You know, it's kind of like the cliffhanger, but I will say this. There is a scripture that says, 
that we can be renewed in our minds, the renewing of the mind. And that is the area that we really have to address the trauma because it has impacted in our soul, our mind, our emotions, and our decisions. And that can come about in some combined ways. But brothers have to be honest and fearless in seeking those particular uh, uh, venues, be it inter whatever interventions are necessary. We can't do this by ourselves. You know, we are not responsible for what happened to us, but we are accountable for our solutions. And this is a very appropriate time for brothers, for us to be renewed in our minds. Yes. But we need the expertise and assistance. And I recommend from black healers in our village to assist us, whether it's individual, relational, or group level of the renewed mind as we decolonize and deconstruct. And not to reconstruct, but to actually create new templates mentally that will assist us in providing covering for our black girls and black women. Wonderful. Well, I am super excited about what's going to happen next month because I really enjoyed uh, what you shared. And from what I'm seeing in the comments, uh, people really appreciated what you had to share with us uh, today. So well, what those we were the to... interruptions. Next month will be the imperatives of covering black girls and women. Awesome. Awesome. So. Uh, we're excited about uh, what we're going to experience next month. Uh, we're going to jump on a uh, jump in Clubhouse in the next few a few minutes. Give it a few minutes for us to jump off of of here. But we're really looking forward to pulling out more related to uh, to this topic. So Clubhouse is a app uh, is an app on your phone, especially if you have um, a um, the Apple uh, Apple phone, um, you're able to access as a app on your on your phone, and then once you sign up, you're able to uh, uh, connect with different groups. And our group is the Liberation Movement, and you'll see in the next few moments that there will be a uh, event that you can click on, and from that event, you then can uh, uh, engage with. Uh, Minister of Van der Horst, a little bit more about the topic of covering that we discussed today. So with that, we want to thank Minister Van der Horst again for uh, his wonderful presentation and uh, look forward to you guys coming back next month to uh, hear more about the topic of covering. All, uh, also, before we leave, want to encourage you to check our website, uh, website out. Uh, it's The Liberation. It was the dash liberation dash movement dot com where you can find out more about the things that we're doing. God bless and have a wonderful rest of the day. I am the liberation movement. 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 My name is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. And I am the Executive Director and Founder of the Liberation Movement, which is a 501c3 organization that works with those who are liberated and seek to be liberated psychologically, socially, and spiritually through educational initiatives. To continue to provide the high quality programming such as Saturday Soul, we need your support. Your consistent monthly investment in the movement will allow us to continue to expand on the excellent work that is already started, such as decolonizing the black mind curriculum that is already in development. So your gifts of any size uh, via K 
Cash App, Venmo, or PayPal would be a blessing to the advancement of this ministry. Thank you in advance for supporting and joining the Liberation Movement. Please remember to join Sydney, me, and our special guest today on Clubhouse at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so we can dive deeper into today's topic. See you soon.